Good afternoon. I'm Susan Weber, and joining Walker and Dunlop CEO Willie Walker today is Tom Gardner, CEO of The Motley Fool. They will discuss Tom's predictions on where the market is headed, investing in the metaverse, crypto, and tech stocks, and what will outperform in 2022. Thank you for joining us today, and now over to Willie. Thank you, Susan and uh, Tom. Welcome back. Uh, so you, um, <laughs> Tom Gardner is co-founder and CEO of The Motley Fool, which he started with his brother, David, in 1993. Uh, Tom uh, attended St. Albans School with me, uh, attended Camp Tamanis with me, uh, then graduated from St. Mark's School and Brown University, and as you can tell, is an old, old friend. Uh, Tom, first of all, welcome back to the Walker webcast. I think, if I'm correct, you, Peter Linneman, Ivy Zellman, and Barry Sternlich are the only repeat guests I've had on the Walker webcast, um, and so that's not bad company. Um, the name Motley Fool comes from William Shakespeare's play, As You Like It, where the court jester known as the fool could speak the truth to the king and queen without having his head lopped off. So let's start with hearing some truth about where the US economy and more importantly, the stock market stick today. Well, we're definitely in a tough place for growth investors. There's no question about that. This is a time where there's a flight to safety and quality and to much larger cap companies and to lower beta companies. And obviously when we uh, look at uh, categories like energy and, and banking, they've been more attractive here over the last six months. It's hard to find a really great growth company in the public markets. Um, that's a mid or a small cap that's had a good six months. And that's hard because that's generally our style of investing at The Motley Fool. Um, not our only style, but our primary style of investing is a very long-term five to 10 plus year view. And you know, it's, it's difficult to remember when you look at the great uh, FANG companies, um, you look at um, Amazon and Netflix, let's just take those two. It's hard to remember how many 30, 40, 50, 70% declines their stocks had along the way to, to creating tremendous wealth for their long-term business owners. So it's it's our highest priorities, investors at The Motley Fool, to teach people about investing in businesses, to be a part owner of those companies, and to expect that the prices are going to move around quite a bit. But So we're seeing a lot of volatility. That's just one segment of what's happening. You mentioned the overall economy. Um, I won't give a 41-minute answer to this question, but I will say that um, we're certainly in um, very unprecedented um, uh, times. I mean, we're not we're not in the 1970s where inflation was for 10 years. The average rate of inflation per year was about 7.6%. So that that's uh, that that's that's not where we are right now. But we definitely are in some unusual times. Uh, um, and hopefully, here coming out of the pandemic and being able to get back to some normalcy. But um, it's a difficult time to be an investor, particularly if you're thinking in the next week or month. If you have a one-year goal as an investor, you're in trouble because one-year goals in investing is not a good uh, is not a good methodology. But if you're keeping your five to ten-year perspective, I think there are a lot of great companies to invest in today. But on that, Tom, you posted on your Twitter feed that you had just recently met with uh, one of your favorite investors, and uh, this person said, "You have stocks been volatile recently?" Question mark. I haven't checked. So as we go into this, you know, you just said unprecedented times and lots of volatility, potentially a war um, over in Europe. Uh, should people just turn it all off and forget about it? Because it certainly feels like people are actively trying to time this right now. Well, there are so many different ways to succeed. So the first thing we would say is we are Motley at The Motley Fool. We don't have a prescription that will work for everyone. After all, two 70-year-olds may have completely different financial pictures, completely different temperament, family situation. So, and that's true for everyone. If we were just to pick that one factor of age, once we start coming down to like, what's your time horizon? Um, do you, are you adding new capital uh, each, each, every two weeks, every month, every year, or have you invested all your money that you have to invest? Um, how much of a drawdown can you handle emotionally? And that's a difficult one for people to assess. So there are so many factors that we all face. That's the, that's the great challenge. And the great challenge of being an advisor as we are at The Motley Fool is how do we try to meet everyone on their terms? But I would say if we take the average person in the average situation, whatever we think that is, historically, it's better to turn it off in periods of volatility than to have it turned up too brightly, right? It's better to step away from it 
and look at the other things in your life if you've got a good game plan. And that would include adding money, diversification, and a long-term five plus year time horizon. When you reduce those three, when you're like, I have two years, I'm not adding any money and I have pretty high expectations for what I need in these two years. And that's what's been happening, obviously, within a great market, that type of thinking develops. Then you don't want to turn that off. But if you've got the five plus year time horizon, you've got a diversified portfolio and you're adding money. Um, this was never confirmed, but it came out of fidelity. If you Google it, you'll see some people saying, oh, I think that probably is real. And other people saying, no, 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 no. I don't know if that's urban myth. But it came out of Fidelity that the best performing accounts in the history of Fidelity were accounts that lay dormant because somebody had died or the family forgot they had them and they were just there compounding. There weren't transactions. There wasn't a lot of course correcting from one quarter to the next. They were just sitting invested and that's a great way uh, to build wealth. So when I hear you say that in, in your six kind of core tenets of investing on your website, you do talk about owning 25 plus stocks, um, holding uh, those stocks for um, a minimum of five years and, and a number of other long-term sort of uh, suggestions, if you will, or principles. Um, but you also on your website have a clock, which is a countdown to when the market closes at the end of the day. And so I am looking at these great principles of buy 25 stocks, hold them for a long time, kind of turn off the noise. And then I got this ticker in the upper right hand corner that's counting down how many not only seconds tenths of seconds i have until the market closes so is the motley fool focused on long-term investing or day trading well maybe this is walt whitman's moment uh, in the sun again i do i contradict myself well i do i contradict myself um, but if i were actually to weave those together into a um a cohesive view of investing i would say maybe as a sports fan i follow all of the games of my teams but I'm not going to trade out of those teams. I'm not going to stop following that sport because my team lost. I did remember at a particular game that Georgetown was losing to Villanova at 20 at the half. And I thought, really? This is my Saturday? We're down 20 at the half? And by the way, Georgetown came back and almost won that game. This was more than a decade ago. But um, And now it's been a tough, tough season for Georgetown Hoya basketball fans, but I digress. Um, the, I think that it's fun to follow the market. So I don't I don't want to deny that for people. I love following business every day. I love reading about every company that I've invested. I love reading about Walker and Dunlop. I love reading about your acquisitions. I love reading about Atlassian. I love reading about Airbnb. I think Airbnb is an absolutely incredible company that's using a wonderful methodology for developing their solutions. And they've got some safety concerns and regulatory concerns. No company has kind of a path to automatic success. So it's endlessly interesting. It's really what you choose to follow. And I would say that, that clock maybe is a little whimsical, a little bit, uh, yeah, short term and that it's telling you when the market's gonna close for the day. Oh, ultimately, I'd love it if the market were open 24 hours a day, um, but but not because of- Please uh, no, a desire. please no. <laughs> I love that. I, I can see going either direction. You know, Buffett, Buffett's great uh, line, one of his many great lines is, you know, if the if the stock market shut down for ten years, I wouldn't be selling out of any of my companies, and that's when you know you've got pretty high conviction in what you've invested. You don't need prices to confirm uh, your your decision making. So, uh, so, but but all in all, I think that's a whimsical side. I could see us removing that altogether. Maybe maybe we'll maybe we'll have a ceremonial moment in honor of. William Walker. And invite and me on. I'll, I'll, I'll be there when the ticker goes <laughs> off. So one of the other tenants that you put up there, Tom, which I thought was interesting, was let winners run. And so I was having coffee two days ago with a business school buddy of mine, John Hereford, here in Denver, and we were talking about GE. And I was making the comment that it's amazing that under Jeff Immelt's reign as CEO of GE, GE lost $400 billion in market cap. And the question was, why? How, how was it that two of the three people to succeed, Jack Welsh, uh, both were basically abject failures as big company CEOs, and only one of them, uh, McNerney, who went on to Boeing, actually did a good job of creating shareholder value. And my friend John's like pulling out his hair and saying, you know, my grandparents own GE, I own GE, and it's just this incredible failure. And so if you looked at GE in 2002, when Welsh turned it over to, to, to Immel, you'd say, let that winner run. And yet, if you'd done that, you lost a lot of money. Um, so how do you determine when it's time to stick in and when it's time to cash in the chips? Well, maybe when the CEO has two corporate jets that they're flying around to make sure that they've always got one at the ready, 
uh, that might be an indication. I certainly think that you were dealt a difficult hand if you took over after Jack Welch. There were a lot of wonderful things created at GE, but it was acquisitive, the accounting. There were a lot. Uh, there were, it was a very complex company to take over. I kind of view that scenario as you were dealt a bit of a tough hand when the world think you got the greatest cards in the world. You actually got some pretty tough cards, but you played them pretty poorly in that situation. So let's go back to let winners run. I think any philosophical principle that we pull out, we can find the exceptions. So, and we could do that, but we'll yeah. spare everyone. We could go to Seneca and just begin reading through his quotes and we would be blown away by how uh, insightful uh, he was in his life. But each one of them, we could take scenarios and see, oh, you wouldn't actually wanna do that there. Um, so I would say, it's, so therefore you would want a collection of principles, right? And they would work against each other. And, and, and then in each one, there would be exceptions on its own, even in the group that wouldn't, that would cause that to be a weak principle to use. So I would say let winners run on average, given the way most people invest is a really good thing to a really smart way to approach the markets. Because when we're investing, when we invest, not to continue to bring up your company, but when we invest in Walker and Dunlop, we're not investing in your next quarter. In fact, in many cases, you might take an action that could slow things down over the next three months because that's you're, you're redirecting things to do something amazing over the next five years. The best CEOs will actually take an action that could harm the short term in order to benefit the long term, right? So that's not gonna match up with the time horizon of the average investor, professional or individual, that's holding a stock for 135 days, right? That's so, so I think let your winners run is, is trying to remind all of us that we're investing in businesses and businesses win over time. This many of the same businesses, going back to college hoops one last time, I, this will be the last one, I promise. Look at the top 20 rankings of college basketball, even if you're not a fan, Go online and look at the last 15 or 20 years of top 20 rankings and see Duke, which could hurt some of us, um, you know, Gonzaga now, North Carolina, Michigan, Kentucky. Like, why are these same teams in the top 20 consistently? Maybe, maybe they're out one year or two here along the way, but they're the consistently great ones because they have a whole system that they use to run that program. And great businesses have a system that isn't about whether or not the next product release is going to be a hit and drive short-term earnings for the next eight months. It's about what, what's the culture, what's the strategy, what's the vision, and what's the execution against those. So let your winners run. It's trying to remind investors to think that these great businesses, they build upon their success over time, and we shouldn't be caught by Wall Street analysts telling us what the target price is this year, because after all, that might be there to drive transactions for that firm. So on that similar one, you, you posted recently um, 10 stocks that had fallen by over 50%, and then um, five of them came back pretty strong and five of them did not. So it was Apple, Microsoft, Netflix, NVIDIA, and Tesla were the five that have obviously outperformed. And AT&T, Chesapeake Energy, Kraft Heinz, JCPenney, and Mattel were the five that way underperformed. I guess the, the question there is in that in, in, in that second group that all underperformed, I mean, those were some pretty dominant brands. I mean, back to your analogy to hoops basketball. Um, yeah, that's true. But there is also a Seton Hall in there that back when you and I were watching college basketball in college, Seton Hall had a pretty damn good team that was in those rankings all the time. And today, Seton Hall is a pretty, you know, middler D1 basketball program. So how do you determine that you're going to pick the NVIDIA and not the Mattel? Well, I love the questions because they're causing us to go a little bit deeper each question. So now let's add some more data. When we look back over, take a 20 year period, take a 50 or take the last century, you're actually talking about, about a very small fraction of public companies that drive all of the returns of the stock market. So, and that's, that's it's hard to keep the Pareto principle in our minds as we move around the world that 20% of our effort drives 80% of the results. I think Peter Drucker once said, 10% of everything that's done inside of a company drives more than 90% of the results. And it's the leadership's responsibility to find that 10% and make it 15%. Because all you need is those few percentage points of outperformance against the competition and you will win your category. So, so that's true in the public markets, that when we look at 100 companies, take a random selection of 100 companies, 10 or fewer of them will account for all of the returns of that group. So that goes to the let your winners run zone, but we're not gonna pick all of those 10, right? So the second principle is to diversify, to have Chesapeake Energy you know, alongside Apple, 
right? And so what's the correct number of companies to have in a portfolio? And that depends on a lot of factors. But at The Motley Fool, our data shows going back almost, gosh, we've been in business now almost 30 years, that holding a stock portfolio of 25 companies, a diversified portfolio, 25 plus companies, and holding them on average for five plus years puts you in the zone of getting potentially, if you're, if you're a growth investor as we are, getting three or four or five really, really wonderful companies. It doesn't take many Netflix. Remember, Netflix is up a, more than 400 times in value since coming public 20 years ago. So 400 times, multiply that against any investment, you're pretty happy. But $3,000 in, you know, got 1.2 million uh, from that. So you're pretty excited when you start to invest and find that level of success. So, um, but, <laughs> You've got your diversified portfolio. Your own, the, a few of those is going to drive the are going to drive the overall returns. So you've got to accept that there are going to be some middling companies, and some losers. You're going to have GE in there, and it's going to hurt. But if we can just tilt you towards that five years, towards letting your winners run, towards adding new money, towards having a diversified portfolio, we start putting the odds in your favor. But any one of those things pulled out, I can have a really good debate with anyone about 25 stocks and people could say, you never follow that many companies. How could you ever follow that many companies? And we could have that conversation. But I think when you get a good collection of factors, the factors that I believe in at The Motley Fool and have proven out over time, you do still have tough years along the way. But um, that diversified portfolio of companies you believe in, and you get to learn from each of those businesses and hopefully get smarter over time. So one of the things that I've watched you focus a lot of time and attention on is what I would call the softer issues in, in both, in, well, softer issues as it relates to identifying opportunities for investment. So corporate leadership, insider ownership, customer delight, company culture, and the quality of um, a board of directors, for instance. Um, as you as you look at investment opportunities, obviously below that are lots of quantitative metrics that you bring into account. And in the list that I looked through, you have plenty of quantitative um, debt metrics and growth metrics and things of that nature. But uniquely, I think, to some degree, you really focus on those what I would call softer issues around a company. Um, which one of those is the most important to you? Is there any way, I mean, obviously there are lots of factors you take into when you invest in a company, but do you sit there and say, if I don't have a CEO that I can trust in, I'm not investing in this company, no matter how good the opportunity is. Uh, and on the flip side, you might not think that the opportunity is that great, but you've got spectacular leadership that could take a company into a space that can't grow that big, but it can dominate the space. How do you sort through those, those various inputs? Well, um, um, I would say, again, I would never want to pull a single factor out and, and, and bank on it. But if I had to, um, uh, there are a few that I would, that I, I think you can beat the market, as long as you build the diversified portfolio and get a number of them. But I'll, 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 since we're, um, you've identified qualitative as something that's important to me, let's take one that isn't easily measured. You're going to have to do some reading and thinking about it. But what I, what I would suggest is uh, read and determine whether or not you think the CEO um, something in the category of is all in um, for the for the next 10 years and 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 by all in um, I would define that as cares about every stakeholder so um, definitely wants to serve shareholders but usually has that kind of down the list a little bit like our shareholders will be fine because I remember Bill George taking over at Medtronic and he gathers the analysts in his, in his, my recollection of this story is that he gathers uh, with his first analyst call and he says, I'm responsible for reporting on what's happening at Medtronic every three months by law and I will. And I will disclose everything that I, that I can to help you understand our company. But I, my, my goal is to be here 10 years and to create the greatest win for everyone who's a partner of Medtronic. Everyone is associated, whether you're a summer intern or you're a lapsed customer that's given up on us. Everyone who's got some stake in Medtronic, I want you to be better off 10 years from now. And that may mean that I'm gonna, we're gonna have a tough quarter or a tough year, but I'm 10 years out. So I have to report to you every three months, but I'm gonna spend extra time with those of you who are here for me with the 10 year journey. If, you're, if you have the ability in your firm to think that way, and there are a lot of investment firms that don't. I gave a talk at NYU and somebody afterwards said, well, I work at one of the big investment banks and you have a real luxury the way you're talking about 10 years, but my clients wanna know how I'm doing every month, every week, every day. I don't have the luxury of sitting back and investing for 10 years. And I delivered a line that I may regret or I almost regretted afterwards. I said, well, Warren Buffett has said, you get the investors you deserve. Right. Uh, and afterwards, uh, the gentleman, his brother came up and was like, hey, you just picked on my younger brother and he played in the NFL as a lineman. 
So he wants to talk to you now. So um, I think time horizon is so important. And I wanna know that leadership is acting on behalf of everyone that's associated with that company, trying to max it out for them over a 10 year period. And Bill George delivered a 60 bagger at Medtronic in 10 years. You don't get that by having just one stakeholder or, or having three year options grants and trying to max out your options in your SPAC, trying to make as much as money as you can, as much money as you can transactionally at that company. You're just gonna be parasitic. You know, uh, some companies are gather vultures around them, whether they're private equity firms with very short-term time horizons that are willing to erode the trust of any stakeholder group in order to max out their one-year result or their four-year result. So I wanna know, does leadership have the control or ownership stake, the voting, um, the support and the time horizon, the commitment to make, to create 10 years of something remarkable? Because I know that we're only, only less than 10% of public companies are gonna deliver great 10-year results. And I think it's gonna come a lot to the leadership commitment to all stakeholders over that period. As you use Bill George and Medtronic as a example, it makes me think about two companies that have recently had leadership changes. Um, one Intel and the other Peloton. Did you hear from either of the incoming CEOs at Intel or Peloton, the Bill George speech? Um, you know, it's funny, I, I, I didn't, I, I have followed the Peloton uh, 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 transition a little bit. I haven't followed the Intel transition as closely. Um, so I can't say, um, I, can't, I can't speak um, usefully about, about that. What do you think? Perhaps you have, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but. No, I mean, look, I, um, I, I, in the context of what Bill George said when he came into Medtronic, I'm not sure that I heard that from either of them, mm -hmm. but both clearly know the businesses that they're coming into. Both clearly have challenging um, uh, turnaround situations and both have massive markets to play into. And so the fact that Intel, given where we are from chips today, isn't, you know, I mean, it's, it's tough to move that aircraft carrier, um, but you'd think that Intel should be able to really um, get itself back on track. Peloton's a little bit different just because it's, it's somewhat of a, um, you know, it's, it's trying to move into a new space that really hasn't been, I mean, we all thought it had created this new space and I don't know what that space looks like going forward. One of the things, Tom, it's actually, I was going to talk about this later, but let me jump back to this now as we're talking about Peloton. So Peloton has two and a half million subs. I think they make about 300 bucks a year per subscriber and their market cap today is somewhere around $10 billion. So as I looked at the Motley Fool, I think you have about a million subs and while someone can come onto the Motley Fool and start getting your research for $99 a year, I think most of your subscription plans are somewhere around 250 to 400 bucks. So let's just swag it and say it's the same as Peloton at 300. And so I'm just thinking you've got about half the number of subs of Peloton. Is Motley Fool worth half as much as Peloton? <laughs> well, we're a private company, so we don't really, our value, we, we do have an internal market. So all of our employees are shareholders. We own our company outright. Um, so valuation does matter in a way, but the valuation game is a very fun game to play. Is it? Is it's kind of like having that market clock up um, and and caring about to follow a little bit what's happening in the market. But but as we know, things can flip uh, pretty substantially, and they have at Peloton um, um, pretty intensely here over the last uh, twelve months. So I mean, I guess I would say I like our business a lot. Um, I like I like being an intellectual property business. Our dad has said to us and been involved all the way through. Um, since we started in 1993, um, and a wonderful advisor, he said, if you continue to do work that's intellectually satisfying, and that's not true for every, I'm not saying that that's like, I'm not saying that's true for every company. I'm just saying for the Motley Fool, if it's intellectually satisfying for everyone who's, who's a part of what you're, um, what you're building, um, that that's going to compound. And I, I think um, I like, I like our business a lot. We, we certainly are subject to the rise and fall of the markets. And that hurts uh, when, when we're, when our style's out of favor, but um, I, I like I like our potential. I think for Peloton, um, you know, it's hard. It's a hard business. You know, you can go back to Nordic Track. Um, uh, you know, uh, C CML Group was the owner of that company. They own Smith and Hawken. They own Bridges Great Outdoors, and they own Nordic Track. And Nordic Track was the big revenue driver. And then just people started to not use that as much. And then they were reselling them. You could buy them rather than buying directly from the company. So it's a it's a hard business, and they definitely got out over their skis. Uh, with inventory management. So it's going to be a difficult turnaround. I expect that they'll be acquired. So as you think about, as you look out on Motley Fool at other companies, what 
what other company do you either emulate or aspire to be? Mm, so many. Uh, <clears throat> 29 years of just calling companies and asking them what they're doing. Most of our culture. And but I'm saying, our... in, I'm saying in the money management or the research space. So I'm uh, oh, I see. not, I'm not, not just like generally speaking, the companies you like, but as you look at other companies that the Motley mm -hmm. Fool is either trying to be mm -hmm. like or is like in your mind, who do you look at as a comp to Motley Fool? I would say that in the public markets, it's hard to find them. It's not impossible, but for the most part, the public markets, the, uh, there can be so much pressure exerted on these companies in the shorter term that they, be, they tend to become more transactional and that's problematic. So I would highlight three private companies, um, Vanguard at the top of the list, uh, I'd say Bloomberg and Fidelity. Um, think about what those three companies have done for investors. Um, we can pick through any given year, any decision they've made, and we can see flaws and mistakes. And Jack Bogle, one of my heroes in finance, um, was happy to point out his many mistakes throughout his life. But when you when you think about what I, I said, I said to Jack in my last interview with him um, that I don't think that there's a single individual or a single company that's given as much to the investor as Vanguard in human history. I mean, at scale, um, tax efficient, essentially free, a diversified indexing. Um, it was so contrary and so attacked, so mocked. When we came out with our first book in 1995-96, The Motley Fool Investment Guide, where we, we brought forward all the performance of mutual funds, and then we showed that Vanguard's simple S&P 500 index fund beats more than 90% of them, and that's even before you start adding in taxes. Um, why does Wall Street even exist for the individual when sitting right there is Vanguard with a beautiful uh, approach? We were really attacked. We were attacked from one news financial channel to the next, one institutional investor to the next, but it's proven to be true over time. And it was not our great discovery. It was Jack Vogel's and his thesis at Princeton in 1950. So I think Vanguard, Fidelity, and Bloomberg, if you think what they've done, none of them really chased short-term success. They, they built something for decades. I mean, if I went outside of money management, I'd say Costco. Um, obviously, you could say Nike. Think of these comps, Starbucks. Think of, think of what Jim Senegal has done with Costco. I mean, he left his employer to compete with them and created Costco. And he said that I did not make any important decision. I have not made any important decision at Costco without sitting down and reflecting on what it might mean for the company in 20 years. And that's what we want from every CEO. Yeah. So um, I want to talk for a moment about your just kind of the way that Motley Fool works, because um, I read all these great articles that um, uh, various writers, so I read one by Sean Williams, who um, wrote a great piece on Berkshire Hathaway recently, and um, it's up on your website today, and it's great, and it's insightful about Berkshire and why he thinks Berkshire is a great uh, investment, but is Sam a writer, an investor, or a portfolio manager? Um, well, we have, um, in this case, he's a writer. Um, um, let's take some of our taglines that the Molly Fool could help us understand. One of them is the Molly Fool investors helping investors beat the market. So we have a couple hundred contract writers at the Molly Fool around the world that are covering with a focus on a particular industry or a particular style of investment. And they are writing articles. Some of them are writing three articles a day. Some of them are writing 10 articles a month. Um, just kind of depends on the length, the depth and the type of work that they want to do and that we need in that category. So in, in Sean's case, he's a writer for us. And he is um, oftentimes um, a lot of our contractors will um, sit um, actively on Motley Fool Live, which is our um, 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, live video uh, throughout every day for our members. Um, but we do have people who are then running portfolios for us. There are subscription services, so you might pay um, $499 a year for Epic Bundle at the Motley Fool, and you would get a collection of solutions where an advisor is picking stocks and teaching you their style of investing. And then at a higher price point, above $1,000 a year, we're actually managing money in full view. So you can see we've allocated a million dollars towards dividend investing and running a real portfolio. You see how we allocated, how we review the companies, um, how infrequently we transact, um, and you, you see the full uh, collection. So, so we have that, and then we have a money management business as well, and that is a regulated business that sits outside, and you're not going to really see uh, the the leaders of that uh, out in the media or, or or writing very frequently. And so, beyond that, on your website, you also have an area called the Ascent, uh, which has a number of it's got it's got 
from my take, incredibly insightful reviews of everything from credit cards to student loans to all sorts of other financial services. Um, two things. One, um, how important is the ascent in those partner relationships to the Motley Fool's overall economics? And second of all, why don't you just go out and do them all yourself? Mm. Um, so the first one, it's a smaller part of our overall business, but a very meaningful and very rapidly growing part of our, of our site. We have wanted, it's kind of in our name and in our DNA, to prepare the whole world to invest. And not everyone is sitting here right now ready to invest. If you have $8,000 of credit card debt at a 15.2% interest rate, which is a crime, um, you, you shouldn't be investing in the stock market trying to beat that, right? We need to help you pay that down. So there's a whole foundation before you can start to make smart long-term investments. And we had trouble creating a subscription out of it because a lot of that content is for free and not necessarily, it's not as exciting. Um, it's not as, as fun covering companies. Um, and so we were really never able to crack the code on subscriptions. So we created the business model of a lead generation model. And the danger in that model is that we would point a user to someone who's paying us a lot of money, even though it's not a great solution. In our case, because it's not our primary business, we don't feel that tension and pressure. We have an amazing team uh, sorting through deals where, as disclosed on the site, we are paid by um, partners on that as are others in advertising. However, it is our North Star to help you get the best solution. So I'm happy that it's not our primary business, um, but it is a very rapidly growing side of our company. And it has proven to be a way to sustainably uh, spend some marketing capital to get more and more people to get themselves set up and get their first brokerage account and start investing. Um, and then why not do it ourselves? I really think because it's not our, it's not our aspiration. Um, I think we're, we're sticking to our knitting a little bit by focusing on subscription and, and long-term uh, investment. Um, but there are so many pieces to the personal finance uh, puzzle of, of having a great long-term game plan, right? We, we really don't want you borrowing money to buy stocks. We don't, we want to help you pay off your student loans. I do think given the size of our audience, we had 300 million unique uh, individuals come into our site over the last 12 months. I do think we have the potential to start gathering almost a little bit different than this, but think of Groupon, like started gathering more and more people to negotiate better and better deals, particularly because it's not the cornerstone of our business. What we want to do is get you ready to invest for the rest of your life. So uh, in talking about the research on your site, um, I read a piece by Anand Chakavelu, um, who wrote top 21 stocks for 2021. And two of those were Altria and Philip Morris. Where do you stand on sin stocks and the Motley Fool's either responsibility or not to have an opinion about those types of investments? Well, this is always a little bit under review with the Motley Fool, I will say. What we have chosen to do in 29 years, which I like, I'm definitely open to reconsidering this, but what we've done for 29 years is to say it's up to each individual who works at our company because it's up to each individual investor to draw up what, you, what works for you. So for some people, it is completely wrong to buy cryptocurrency because of the environmental drag. For other people, um, they, they, they might look at it and see there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of uh, reliance on servers and data centers for video gaming. Um, so I'm not sure why we should be punitive in that one category. Um, so there's a grand debate. And I think probably what, what I want more than anything for the Motley Fool to contribute to society in this zone is to have that discussion, to have that debate and to, to consider in my case, in our case, our mother died of lung cancer. I would never want to, I, I don't support. Um, I think that of all, <laughs> of all the substances out there that shouldn't have been legal, when you look at marijuana, right, I, I'll put psychedelic mushrooms up against up against uh, cigarettes, and I, I think we have a happier society if the latter is is, is never is never uh, available, and the other one is very tightly regulated, but but useful under certain certain circumstances. So so it's a grand debate. It's a grand debate. I wouldn't have that on my list. That company on my list. There aren't many companies that I wouldn't invest in for ESG related reasons, but there are companies that any chance I get to talk to them, I will raise the question or ask. Um, how, how do you think about what's happening in this area of your business? Because it's hard. It's extremely difficult to run a business at scale in the public markets. And you are never going to be on top of making sure that each individual employee, each individual customer, each individual supplier, each individual shareholder is being heard, is having their, um, their hopes and dreams considered, and that, and that a company is fully enlightened as it goes. Every company has weaknesses. It's the ones that shield themselves from the truth 
that know the product that they're selling is probably uh, uh, a net negative. And, and think about it, there are probably a lot of companies, we could go through the food, the food category, we could go through the, we could go, go through healthcare. We could look at, we could obviously try, try out Purdue Pharmaceuticals, the easy one, but like Purdue Pharmaceuticals happens because there's something very wrong in the system that's happening in a lot of other ways. And if you look at Philip Morris or you go to the broad category of food and beverages, we could see things that we know. They're, they're proven to be damaging. Um, there's type two diabetes in a can being sold, but, um, but I think it's best to keep that open rather than to have the Motley Fool try and be an arbiter of what is on the right side of the line and what isn't. By the way, have you watched um, the Hulu series, Dope Sick? I have indeed, and I would also recommend Dope Sick Nation if you haven't seen it, which is a Vice uh, documentary series that's fantastic. And it's just, it's just, I mean, it's so heartbreaking because uh, um, it's effect, effects. It's, 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 a, it's a crossover story where uh, whereas in society, I'd say going back through our, throughout our lives, we're similarly similar age, really, and we've known each other for so long. You go back through, in times you could pinpoint and say like, that drug is wrong. The person who uses that drug is wrong. They're doing something they shouldn't have been doing and they're paying the penalty for it. You know, then you become a little bit more enlightened and realize, well, that's, that's an illness, right? And then there's, a, how do you actually cure that illness? And if we take the case of, of Oxycontin or, and then leading to heroin, if you take the case of palliative care or pain, pain, management you have a lot of people who like blew their knee out playing hockey in high school and in 18 months i mean our, our grandfather um had a suffered a devastating injury playing football at georgetown university um 100 years ago and was hospitalized and became addicted to a painkiller and spent i think a year uh, recovering from that before coming back and then became the athletic director at georgetown university but um <clears throat> there's a lot of um poor management of of uh on the regulatory side. And it's it's obviously, it's hard. As, as one of the most brilliant people I ever met when I was at Brown, by the way, I went to Groton, not St. Mark's. That's Dave. Oh, that's right, your brother. That's all right, it's good. We're, they're they're true, both wonderful schools. They are right. But by the way, so you also, right. you also when you tweeted out on this discussion, said that WND is only up 10X since our IPO. And last right. I checked, we're closer to 14. So 14. Uh, just, just checking. I said know. greater than 10X, so you're right. You're totally right, Willie. I blew it earlier, like two okay, months ago. It's okay, so uh, Groton, go, go <laughs> right ahead. Where were we? But I would say, I would just I would just say that um, one of the most intelligent people I met in my life was a was a poet who lived in Providence, Rhode Island when I was in college. And he said, everything around us in this world is a tool that can be used. But figuring out when to use them and when and how to use them and how not to is one of the big journeys of our lifetime. So and he said, if you look at morphine, it has an, a wonderful use in the last you know, you know, week of someone's life in hospice care. It is not a wonderful thing to use when you're 17 or 23 years old and you have uh, emotional pain from your upbringing and you're trying to figure out how to how to medicate that right so so i think that's what business is trying to do uh, there are many other forces than just business but trying to find the solutions out there that help customers in the world improve and we can all debate how much or how little we think that system is working right now but i think there are obviously a lot of wonderful examples and a lot of amazing efforts that are being made at companies to try and make the world better and the more, the better, because now we're so connected. You can't hide as a company. You're not going to get to hide and say like, well, um, thankfully, I didn't know that deal we made in that, you know, uh, outside the U.S. and how we treat our employees in that uh, factory that nobody's visited. Um, um, that's not really happening anymore. And it was happening 25 years ago. So um, as you say, tools that we use and when we use them, um, it's, I hope, a good segue to crypto. Um, you did a little poll on your Twitter feed as it relates to, and you made a statement, 90% of crypto will be worthless. And you didn't give actually a time frame to it, but let's just say for argument's sake, worthless within the next five to 10 years. Um, what was the response to that? And then what's your opinion on that? Well, I'd say that there was almost unanimous agreement. Um, and then because there are somewhere like 10 to 20,000 forms of cryptocurrency right now, um, somebody correctly said, but if that's true, that means there, there could be, you know, hundreds and hundreds of success stories. Um, and I, and I, and part of that tweet was to say that this is a fruitful area for research there. It, we're moving into a more digital, uh, digital transformation is for real. It's a little, it, it may, we may get worn down by that uh, term. It may start to be cliche and companies may attach themselves to try and get a short-term valuation boost. But the reality is we're working in different places. We're connecting in different ways. 
were uh, the 23 year old of today is not looking to buy an apartment or a car with any near anywhere near uh, the, the the frequency or as early in their life as as was happening 20 years ago or 40 years ago. So we're 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 moving into a virtual world and we're not transacting with paper and and uh, metal uh, um, like we used to. And it's amazing the drop off, right? I remember studying Mastercard and Visa just five years ago and seeing, you know, well, 87% of all transactions are still happening with paper money. It's down to 83%, it's down to 80%. And that was a wonderful way to see how large the market opportunity is for MasterCard and Visa. But here we are pandemically, the drop-off has been dramatic, right? I mean, obvious, it's obvious, but we're not going back. There are a lot of things we're not going back to. We're definitely not going back to going to the ATM, getting cash and transacting that way. We're not going to 24 year old of today is not thinking that way. Their whole uh, view of transactions is wildly different than my my father and mother's. Um, and so, um, so there is a place for digital assets, very big place for cryptocurrency, very big place for digital currency. There is a very big place for non-fungible tokens, NFTs. So, the, the, so this is real, in my opinion, this is real. Against that, um, half of it, I'll say, could almost be qualified and defined as fraud, right? Because what you have is, I'll create this digital image and I'll sell it and I'll create a limited supply, right? I mean, you're, you're almost talking about like the basic principles of a Ponzi scheme that are right. being used. So never let none of us ever forget that a large percentage of these are being created to make money for the creator. And that's what business in some ways is, of course, right? But you don't get very far in business if that's really all it's about. So I started this company so I could make as much money as possible. You know, whenever you hear an entrepreneur say, I started this company because I could never work for anyone else. You're like, well, who are you telling your own employees? I mean, so, so a lot of this is so, so narrow, so self-interested. And, um, and it, it's, we're just going to see a series of collapses around that. But against that, there are technically sophisticated um, creations designed to try and serve an important a function. And I, I would just say, take NFTs, which they're, it's such, it's such an interesting area, but let's take an NFT. All, all you have to do with a, a non-fungible token is get, give it some utility, give it a reason, a use. Like, don't just sell me a, a, a digital pickle that everyone's bidding on. There's only 11 of these pickles. And you know, uh, you know, no, sell me something that because I have that token, I get some benefit. I mean, you can even just start with the Disney, you know, I fast track, I get to, I get to jump forward in this line because I have this, right? Start to think that way about digital assets. And all of a sudden you can see, we're gonna have a digital wallet with our collection of things, right? And those are gonna augment our reality. We're gonna get certain benefits as we move around in the world. Right. And every business is going to want to have some sort of token that rewards you for loyalty. Right. And in its base level, one dimensional, we've already had those. Right. But when it starts to be a community thing, digitally online, you can meet other customers. Your business is really going to want that. So so I think that there are a number of expressions that are still very early in their infancy, but it's going to be well, it's like the public markets, but it's going to be even more dramatic because there's no cash generating asset here. Right. These these, um, uh, you know, the, the cryptocurrency is not a functioning business, but but I, I probably disagree with Charlie Munger a little bit on that. I know he he had some choice words for Bitcoin, uh, yeah. um, but 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 obviously to me, this is a major, major trend, but it's it really it's so easy to create them almost like SPACs. It's so easy to create these things and sell them that um, there's a lot of there's a lot of borderline fraud happening right now. Your comment about the CEO said I couldn't work for anybody else and set up my own company um, reminds me of another sort of quip that you made, which was when an executive says, this is how our company is like Amazon, you say sell. Um, <laughs> is Amazon that untouchable in your mind? Um, I think it's mostly that whenever, when I'd like to know that your company is like your company and why it's, and why it's special. I think once I hear that, I, it's like I'm hearing a VC pitch. Um, rather than um, something really driven by purpose, right? It's it's more transactional thinking than, um, you know, that's, I, I look at Atlassian. If I, I would be shocked if I ever heard Atlassian's leader say anything like that. I mean, they're so heart, soul, and skin in the game 
They have voting control. They have huge ownership stake. There are two founders uh, that created this business just by building something that one, they wanted to make their life easier, right? So when, when, when you start saying we're like Amazon, it, it, you're, you're, you're probably talking about that you're going to reinvest your capital and you won't be cash flow, you won't be net income positive, gap positive for a long period, or whatever that factor is that you were going to take from this business and plow it into this business. Overall, those are more financial in nature. And what I want to hear from the CEO is what you're trying to do in the world. So Leo's son, just talking about crypto and the growth in crypto and the opportunity there, Leo's son, who writes for The Motley Fool, did a great piece on Shopify and essentially said, great company in a great space, uh, a huge and growing space of e-commerce and retail e-commerce, but potentially still a little overvalued at where it is. Um, back to the very beginning of the conversation, Tom, where it's like, you know, buy something, hold it for five plus years. Given the growth in e-commerce and retail e-commerce, isn't it time for all of us to go buy Shopify? Well, it's a wonderful question. I mean, the stock was at 1700. It's now below 700. Um, I purchased at prices higher than this and I purchased at prices lower than, than this. Um, so in, if, you, if we're talking about a major theme, yes. If we're talking about a very well-run company um, with um, um, real thought leadership and market leadership inside of Shopify, yes. Um, but if you're, if we're hoping that there's an automatic winner right in front of us, um, I would say I would never um, approach it that way. If we, if we take Shopify right now, um, every company, every great company kind of begins to hit the wall of its present game plan. Think of Netflix with DVDs in the mail and think what happened when they hit that wall all of a sudden. It's like Reed Hastings sitting on a park bench doing an iPhone video and introducing Quickster. <laughs> and everyone saw I, our chief investment officer, Andy Cross, convinced me not to sell. I was like, I don't know what to make of this. I've never seen anything like this. How can a company of this size and scale present themselves this way with this transition and quickster? It just, it doesn't feel right to me. So every company hits those walls. Intel, think of Intel going, you know, uh, um, memory, memory chips, only the paranoid survive, Andrew Grove. Um, so every company hits that. Shopify is hitting a little bit of a wall right now on fulfillment. We don't actually quite know what they're going to do, right? Amazon is gonna to get to a point where it's like, whatever you order will be there in 30 minutes. And that's very hard to compete with. And it's a question as to how important that is to the, to the buyer. Uh, so when you order things online, how important is it that it's there in an hour, a day, a week? Certain items, you need them in an hour. The problem is that those items that you need in an hour, you might as well bundle the things you need in a week, right? You form the habit around the things you need in a shorter period of time. So, you know, look at the size of Amazon's fulfillment invest, distribution and fulfillment investments versus Shopify. I mean, it's, there's no way to even compare them. So Shopify has its merchants, but they're going to be moving towards two-day delivery. And the question is, what will the consumer, what will the demand be for the timing of delivery around the items that you can purchase? And obviously, there's some people that won't buy from Amazon at all. So they oppose Amazon on many different levels, let's say, or some different levels. So, but those are usually niche areas, right? It's hard to stop the major mainstream momentum of people wanting greater convenience in their life. Um, so that would at least put one question mark. If somebody was thinking, well, Shopify, I mean, isn't it almost automatic here below 700? I'm gonna take 20% of my net worth and put it in this one company. I would say, no, I don't think you should ever put more than 5% into any uh, individual company. But I, I certainly would make Shopify, one of 20 or 30 stocks in my portfolio today. Yeah. Cause I, cause ultimately really sorry, because I believe like, as I believe in you and as I believe I mentioned Atlassian or I mentioned leadership at Airbnb, I think is very impressive. I believe that these company, we shouldn't expect these companies not to hit a wall. We should know that they will and ask, is that the leadership team that's going to figure it out? And honestly, if you look at Virgin Galactic and all the executive turnover there, and the chairman just stepped down and Branson sold a lot. That just doesn't look like it. It looks like, hey, if we hit a pebble, everyone's going to leave. But I need to know you're going to hit a wall. You're, everything's going to fall apart in front of you. And you're going to have to figure out. You're going to be embarrassed. You're not going to have great answers on that quarterly call because you're in the process of figuring it out. We should all reread Only the Paranoid Surviving. See what Andy Grove was saying ha needed to happen in their culture to metamorph to go through the metamorphosis and come out um, as the butterfly. So I think Shopify has that. Um, and that's why I'd ha be happy to have them as one of 25 stocks in portfolio. 
When you talk about companies hitting a wall, um, it makes me think about all of us in our personal lives um, hitting walls at various points. And I asked David Rubenstein when he was on two weeks ago um, to give me his personal board of directors. And he actually afterwards said to me, I love that question because I got to shed some light on some people who've been hugely helpful to me in my career. And he mentioned his two partners at Carlisle, as well as um, a couple other people. Um, who's on Tom Gardner's personal? I know you've got a actual Motley Fool board of directors, but who's on Tom Gardner's personal board of directors? Some very long-term friends of mine, my dad, my brother, um, and some CEOs that I met along the way. Um, I and some of them don't even know they're on my personal board because I, I don't really, I, I, it's not a formal thing, perhaps it should be. Um, but I would say, for example, the conversations I've had over 15 years with a man named Salim Basul, who was previously the CEO of a company called Middleby, which was, became the largest commercial oven, um, kitchen equipment, oven equipment business um, in the world. He took it over when he bought 20% of it by borrowing money. He bought 20% of the company when it was market cap, $10 million in the public markets. It was gone. It was bankrupt. Essentially, he bought it and he turned it into about a seven billion dollar company when he um, stepped away from Middleby um, two years ago. Now, Salim is the new CEO at Six Flags, and I can't wait to see what's going to happen at Six Flags because of Salim. He is a absolutely relentless customer advocate. And so if you've been to Six Flags and you didn't have a good experience, maybe go again in 18 months and see what it's like. He's, he's already struck a partnership with Starbucks. He's, he, is a, he is a force. And I like to have a few of those um, that, uh, people that have been out there um, running a company with a, you know, a large employee base, a lot of customers, a lot of risk, a lot of exposure, um, and trying to manage a, a balanced life in the process. And I'd say I've learned so much from Salim. Um, over the years, I could quote 10 different things from him. I won't do that. But if you want to read about a great CEO and what he created, I'll give you one because it's a fun one. Um, Salim says, the number one competitive advantage in the world for business is this. If it's hard for your company to do, very hard, and it's very good for the customer, that's the greatest competitive advantage at all. We think that it's like, our customers want this, let's give it to them. It's not that hard. We should be able to do it. We can make money on it, right? Like, Less work, more reward, and that's our methodology. And Salim has a different approach. Salim's approach is, what if I could guarantee to all of my restaurant customers that equipment for five years, 100% all costs covered of any fixes? Or what if I could do that? And then, you know, the CFO and others are like on the board, like, yeah, but you can't do that. But what if I could? Wouldn't that be the greatest thing that we could possibly offer? So it's a good game to play with a leadership team. What is the single greatest thing we could do for our customers? It, let's not measure whether, like, let's not do SWOT analysis. Let's, let's, let's actually allow ourselves to think about the thing that would be most complicated, almost impossible for us to do, but it would be incredible for our customers. And there's gotta be some of that going on at Tesla to have created what they've created and to look for leaders and businesses that are acting that way. I'm smiling broadly on that because my my partner, Howard Smith, who's the president of Walker and Dunlop, and I went back and forth on an idea I had last week, and um, it's exactly that. And so, Howard, I'm going to follow up after this with you on what Tom <laughs> just said as it relates to hard to do and great for the customer. Um, so, Tom, uh, in, in an article on you in Time magazine, they said even billionaires get ideas from the Motley Fool. Can you give us an anecdote about a billionaire who got an idea from the Motley Fool that you know about? Um, well, there, there, I, I can't. I can't give a specific. I mean, I could give a specific one, but it, it's not that uh, surprising. It's actually kind of straightforward. What's happening? We, um, by virtue of recommending companies and following companies and contacting companies, um, we had a breakthrough about 15 years ago when we began to hire a team that is a full-time team for us that just every day, all day, is calling, connecting with anyone that anyone in our company wants to learn from. So a business writer, a CEO, a college professor, anything, anywhere in any subject that you find interesting, send that name to this team, they'll contact and see if that person will have a 30 minute phone call or a 15 minute call or, and in general, if you make a small ask out of the gate, you're flattering them. Our company is, is you know, has, has taken a real interest and, and it, uh, is very thankful for what you're doing. We'd love to talk to you about it. Uh, and then that 15 minutes will lead to maybe a contract work together. Um, when we're in offices, a visit to the office, and sometimes a full-time assignment, and sometimes they work with us, join our board and with us for many, many years. It's happened multiple times. And so um, if we just think of things that way, we're sitting in the 
front row seat, just learning from every company and getting the best practices and testing them in the laboratory of our company. And so in the process of doing that, we're meeting a lot of different CEOs and then CEOs look at what we're doing and like, you know what, I've decided to take a portion of my money and invest it with the Motley Fool, um, with your style investing. And so we have a lot of CEOs who have had some wonderful success in their career that are using our either uh, Motley Fool money management, our regulated business, or they're using um, our subscription services to learn and make investments. And in some of the more enjoyable cases, you know, they've gone and started businesses, with members of ours or two members have met in an event and decided let's let, we both are interested in robotics. Let's, why don't we start a small little business and then it grows to become, become something viable. So that's probably as much and as, as enjoyable as anything else for me in 29 years of the Motley Fools to see our network connect people together to create things. Because my dream and, and the whole reason that I've done this for 29 years, just for me personally, is because I think a business can, can be so creative and so innovative, so dynamic, so interesting. We want more employment. It can do so many wonderful things in the world, but I would say on average, scale of one to 10, the reputation of business and corporations in the US, probably a five, I'd say out there in the world. Um, but not, they're, but they're, not you. So, like, uh, so the economists call the Motley Fool an ethical oasis. So let's pause for a second, first of all, and take our hat off to you for creating an ethical oasis per the economist. But I guess my question to you, Tom, would be in a dispersed environment, not, you know, you, I've been to your headquarters in Alexandria, unbelievable workspace. You told me yesterday, very few people are back there. How do you maintain an ethical oasis in a distributed model? Well, in a way, our business has always been distributed in that we don't, we, we connect with our members online. And so it's been a digital experience for us. So, so the transition in March, 2020 to what we've had to all go through over the last two years wasn't as hard for our company. Um, um, and we had already spread out to different offices. So, so I think that, um, gosh, I mean, to, to get back to that um, uh, economist quote, I would say um, that the financial world needs a company that wants to be held accountable, that admit its mistakes, and you know, calling ourselves fool is probably a pretty good early indication that that's that's what we're about. Um, but that um, is going to create an open environment where people can learn, uh, because a lot of what happened in financial services when we started, prices were much higher, right? They were much higher, and the general pitch from Wall Street was, "You're you're not smart enough to do this. You shouldn't do this. You shouldn't even try." There were ads on TV. This is like doing your own dental work. Right, and we said in response to that, no, just call Vanguard. It's a five-minute phone call. Distribute your money into four different index funds. They can set it all up for you, and you'll beat ninety-five percent of what Wall Street has to offer. So, finding um, uh, being being very solutions-oriented and genuinely wanting a smarter, happier, and richer world—that's the mission of the Motley Fool—to create a smarter, happier, happier, and richer world. Um, that's that doesn't require being in a on-premise together. As, a, as an employee or as a customer um, or as a partner of ours. Um, it does make things different, in some ways easier, in some ways harder. But our mission, culture-wise, at The Fool right now, we've decided to go for the impossible, kind of the Salim Basul that we talked that you're gonna be sharing with Howard Smith, your idea. Sorry, Howard, about that one, by the way. But I would say, so, um, we are gonna try and create it our culture. We're, we're about 630 full-time and maybe 700 contract at The Fool. We're going to try to create the work atmosphere at the Motley Fool where you tell us how you want to work. And we're going to set you up. So if you want to be in office five days a week, but you don't want to come in mornings, or be in an office five days in a week, but you only want to be in mornings, you don't want to be in an office ever again. Um, we're trying to create the environment where you tell us what you want. And obviously, it's group of it's, people fit into general categories then. And if we can solve those categories, what if we could create the company where you could work exactly as you want to on the hours that you want to in the locations that you want to. Um, um, and there have to, there, there's a 50, 50 shared responsibility. We can't just like, Hey, go do whatever you want. Hopefully it'll end up working out for our customers. Um, there's a good disciplined Apple product methodology that we use at the Motley Fool that brings us together and integrates it. But the more we looked at it, the more we began to ask ourselves, like there are people who are immunocompromised who, even though we're an Omicron, you know, uh, BA47362, and it's the 39th mutation in the last, you know, seven months, and it looks like it's becoming more transmissible, but much less severe, there's still immunocompromised uh, um, 
uh, bulls at our company that are at risk? And do we want to say to them like, sorry, choose your employment because or not because we need we need you to be in this environment at this these times. So it's it's endlessly challenging, but that's kind of what we all signed up for when we when we went out to create something. Um, and and that's that's the dream that we have. What 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 if everyone could pick their work environment and we could make it work? So there are two th two quick things on that, and then then I, we're going to close. The the the, <laughs> the the first is just that um, we designed it that way, and that's what we signed up for makes me think about inflation and the fact that um, there was an article this past weekend on Jerome Powell and the unprecedented measures that the Fed took during the pandemic, as well as the Treasury Department and the Trump administration to basically save the economy. And in it, they mentioned that uh, Royal Caribbean, no, uh, Carnival Cruises borrowed $6 billion in April of 2020 to keep it afloat. And that was actually the time I wish I'd known that at the time, because you would have been like, go long. If a, a company that's completely out of business, their entire business has been shuttered, can go and borrow six billion dollars. That was a direct correlation to the amount of capital that the Fed had flooded into the system. And today we're not recreating the cruise industry from whole cloth. And I don't care about the cruise industry. But the bottom line is that's what we did. We decided we made a decision as a country to save all businesses flood it with capital. And today the inflationary pressures were gaining. It's just the aftermath of all that. And hopefully the Fed can control this, but we signed up for this. I mean, this is, we're inheriting those actions and thankfully Carnival Cruises still exists and you're not having to recreate the, uh, the, the, the cruise industry from whole cloth. Um, the, other, the other piece to it is it relates to in office, out of office, Tom, that I think is so interesting in what you just said. Kramer and David Faber this morning on Squawk Box we're talking about, or Squawk Alley, we're talking about this exact issue. And as they were talking about it, my mind went to the following, which is just that there are going to be some people who take your path and it works brilliantly. There are going to be other people like David Solomon at, at Goldman Sachs who say, Ali Ali Income Free, everyone back in the office, and might lose 20% of their workforce. They may not, they may. But they, there is no defined path and that that's capitalism. There will be different models and some will work and others won't work and the winners will win and the losers will lose. And so as long as the government doesn't step in, as long as the government doesn't require companies to say everyone's got to be back in or you're going to be charged this if they don't do this, as long as they stay out, and this is probably the most libertarian thing I'll ever say, um, as long as the government stays at bay, we can all figure out as far as leaders of companies what the proper path is for our company, for our clients, and the way we need to move forward. And so I love hearing the model that you're adhering to. Um, mm -hmm. Final thing I'd say is you talked about learning and that the most exciting thing about The Fool is that people get to learn every single day. Um, and you, this is the second time you've come on and I learned a ton by having you on. And so I just wanna say thank you, thank you for coming on and spending an hour with us and giving us your incredible insights into the markets and what you're seeing at The Fool today. Well, mutual, Willie. I love our every conversation we have. I love following your company. I've learned so much from your culture all the way through to a business that I didn't know very much about. Right when I remember when I first was talking to you, um, when we first reconnected, and you know, it's just not a category that I was spending a lot of time. And what I, one thing I do want to say is there has not been a situation. Every time I'm in in a conversation or in a circle that's somehow adjacent or connected to your business, I ask. As, a, as somebody, a shareholder and somebody who's recommended your company to our members, I ask, and I will say that it is unanimous, the positive reputation you have at Walker and Dunlop. And that, and that does matter. Now, sometimes positive reputation is just marketing, right? But, but when you demonstrate that you're trying to build something, that you're gonna innovate, and you're gonna be above board and transparent in what you're doing, you start to attract the, the customers of this world and the employees of the world, and you get the stakeholders that you deserve. And uh, so I, I love all of our associations with your company. I also love that we're all kind of in the DC area and trying to create more great businesses. Some of our big DC area businesses have kind of disappeared over the last 20 years. And um, it's great to see innovators uh, merging. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of you and your company and uh, thankful to spend this hour together. And we could talk for another hour, but we, we, we certainly could. And there, just, just one final point. If you do an analysis of five-year total shareholder return on all the public companies in the greater DC area, one company you know and invested in is number one on that list. So just as, a, as an aside. Um, great to see you, Tom. We'll be in touch. Thank you, Willie. Right Take on. care. Thanks, Hold everyone, on. for joining us today. Have a great day.